Hey friends, Dean here. Before we get you on to your episode, I want to take a moment to invite you to our next virtual online trivia night. Wednesday, May 13th at 8 p.m. Join us either on our Facebook group or on our YouTube page for three rounds of fun trivia, music questions, movie questions, general knowledge questions. It'll be a fun time and a chance to win some prizes and have just a good relaxing night uh, of some trivia at, at home. You don't even have to go out for it. So don't forget, Wednesday, March 13th at 8 p.m., Join us on our Facebook group or YouTube for three rounds of fun virtual online trivia. We'll see you there. Travel back with us to 1977, as we're talking about an artist that finally found the formula for success. It would take 10 albums to arrive, but when it did, it was a smash. We're opening the Steve Miller Band's Book of Dreams. Stay with us. Get ready for the 3324 Podcast, where lifelong friends Dean Legiro and Eric Coover share their love of all things music and movies. Dean has directed short films and is a music trivia buff. And Eric, trained in audio engineering, brings his extensive knowledge of music and film to the conversation as they discuss, debate, and celebrate their favorite albums, films, and much more. Welcome, friends, to the 3324 Podcast podcast. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for notching out a little bit of time in your day, your morning, your evening. If you're an insomniac, we're, we're happy to, to stay awake with you whenever you're listening to us. Uh, we're, we're here. That's right. We are here. We're here for you. And we're going back to the 70s. Yes, back it's always a pleasure. Back to the 70s again. <laughs> always a pleasure to talk it's about. Our, it's our 70s. comfort zone. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It, it's, it's our, it's our, <laughs> It's our worn out pair of jeans. It's our denim jacket. It, it's the comfort stuff that we put on and drape ourselves in and make us feel all warm and comfortable. That's what the seven. Oh, that's are. that was clever. That was very. Right? That sounds very uh, very. It's cozy. That pair of like winter gloves that you pull out each year and you put them on and they just <laughs> yep. fit right and it's good and. That's what the or, 70s are. Or your favorite slippers or Yeah, something. any of those yeah. things. It's, yeah, you know, bathrobe, whatever. Your, your favorite book <laughs> that you open up and in, you know. <laughs> That's what the 70s are to us. It's a, it's a comforting, it's a comforting yeah, time. Yeah, it absolutely is. And uh, actually, uh, ironically enough, we're, we're going to get into 1977. And mm -hmm. geez, uh, we've already talked about a lot of albums from 77. <laughs> so we we're going to get into that. Yeah. So let's, let's get into the stats. Uh, well, let's do a little shilling first. You know what? Join us on Instagram and Facebook at 3324podcast. Join us on social media. Come on, take the next step. You're probably already on your phone listening to this. You can still play it and, and reduce it and go to Facebook and find us and join the group there. Or you can go to Instagram and like a couple of our, our photos. That would be great too. Uh, if you're listening on Spotify, you can give us a rating. You can give us like yeah. multiple stars. Why not? It doesn't not? cost anything. It's free. That's right. It's free. Join the group. Yeah. Join the discussion. That's Give us it. your feedback. We want we, you here we, with us. Yeah, we want exactly. you here with us. And we're so. talking about the Steve Miller Band uh, and their their or his album, uh, Book of Dreams, released in May of 1977, mm -hmm. produced by Mr. Steve Miller. Hit number two on the Billboard charts. There were three singles released from this album. Uh, Jet Airliner, which hit number eight. Jungle Love, which hit number 23. Swing Town, which hit number mm -hmm. 17. This album went three times platinum, so that's in excess of three million copies. No slouch. No. Like I said in the all. open, this was Steve Miller Band's tenth album. Yeah, that blew my mind. I didn't really, I didn't realize he was around that long. Yeah, <laughs> to, you know, he's, you know, but you know, it makes sense. A uh, little, but, little know. late to the dance, but when you know, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> I guess patience is a virtue because it, it, it would, it would eventually pay off. Uh, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2016, another grumpy inductee who had a, f a yeah. fair share of things to say about uh, during his induction as well. So we may or may not get to that, but uh, <laughs> he certainly didn't top Alex Lifeson's induction speech, but uh, Steve Miller, Steve Miller afterwards really had some choice words for the hall and they, they took it up. They took it on the chin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's talk a little bit about, about this album I, and what is your relationship with, with Steve Miller? Oh, what, you know, um, we don't well, really talk I, about Steve Miller a lot, you and I. No, if we don't. Um, but, you know, again, he's just one of those guys that uh, uh, was around. You know, that was, uh, you know, all over the radio. He had multiple hits. You know, the album before this, Fly Like an Eagle. Yeah. That's the one that I had. Mm -hmm. I remember owning specifically if it was one album that I ever had besides the greatest hits. Yeah. Or the various compilations, you know, over the years. But 
uh, Fly Like an Eagle was the one for mm-hmm. me. Uh, I really dug that album as well. A lot of great stuff on there. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 and I just uh, learned that he, that album and this album were actually, they recorded the bulk of the songs together. Like they, it was, it was recorded around the same time that, so you could almost say that these albums might be, this could have been a double, a double record, I suppose. What do you yeah, think? They're, they're both, uh, they both uh, were able to uh, find the formula. This one, you know, mm-hmm. that one did, I think went to number three on the charts. This one went to number two. Yeah, uh, this one kind of surpassed it. So, "Fly Like an Eagle" absolutely set the table and set kind of the kind of the the pattern and the blueprint because there was three yeah. like gigantic songs off of "Fly Like an Eagle," but there was some other. You know, this guy, the, these two albums, "Fly Like an Eagle" and "Book of Dreams," are like FM radio staples. Yeah, because on on "Fly Like an Eagle," you've got "Fly Like an Eagle," obviously, which was a hit. Uh, "Rockin' Me," mm-hmm. which was a hit. "Take the Money and Run," which was a hit. But then you've got "Wild Mountain Honey." Yeah, which was, a, which was an That's FM a radio one. staple. Dance, 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 which was an FM radio s- staple as well. Mm-hmm. And it also started, he started w- with these kind of intros, these synthesizer intros, a little proggy <laughs> yeah. stuff, which, which kind of kind of got me into it. Um, it's, like, yeah, it's like psychedelic. And yeah, there was always yeah. these little, little musical interludes between songs. I, I used to love that kind of stuff. You yeah. Know, and and he was, these that. guys were big for that, but, but not yeah. incorporating the synthesizers, like the synthesi- synthesizers were used for like the intros, but not within the songs. Like when you listen to, when you listen to book of dreams and it opens and it's got the threshold, which is this like instrumental, just swirly stuff. Yeah. And then Jet Airliner kicks in and it's a good straight up guitar song. It, it, <laughs> right. He's not he's not mixing the two. He's using like no. the synthesizers for like the intro swirly stuff. And then he goes he goes right into he, it. He's but, getting your attention. Yeah. He's grabbing your attention with the with the psychedelia, the psychedelia and the you know that sound that you know people well, I mean, if you're if you're if you grew up in the seventies, that was it was, it was pretty a, much it was a part of the landscape. Yeah. And exactly. And, Pop music too was using it very you know, that kind Absolutely. of stuff. Yeah. And this was, yeah. this was all of, this was, he was all yeah. over AM and FM radio. Mm-hmm. Um, my sister was into this. She had this album and that's when I first heard it. Mm-hmm. And I'll never forget it because it is, it is absolutely one of the best album covers ever. Yeah. I absolutely very distinctive. love yep. this album cover. I remember my sister having this album and, and, and her playing it. And then I had a record player and, and I would listen to it. And I was just captivated, but though by the artwork, and and it's uh, it, it's just an absolute piece of art. It, it's it's one of the best album covers ever. Easily one of the best of the seventies. Uh, cover it, it's designed by a, a two artists called uh, Kelly slash Mouse. Mm-hmm. Um, they they did a lot of uh, like, much like Hypnosis. They did a lot of uh, big album covers. They did Grateful Dead's uh, Skull and Roses logo. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They did the the beetle for Journey, which we talked about uh, in the Journey episode. That that beetle, that scarab, was one the of their scarab, iconic yeah. yep. their iconic images. Uh, they did the cover for Grand Illusion by Styx. The, this album cover stands stands head and, head and shoulders above them. This is oh sure. You know, if you get yeah. a nice copy of this album, this is a frameable piece of art. I just absolutely love the Pegasus, the rainbow, the rainbow wings. <laughs> the, the the circle around it. I mean, and this was in in the era of album covers as pieces of art, and and I'll never forget this. And it was just kind of, kind of my sister was on like the the listening to this. She was getting into Bruce Springsteen, and I was obviously yeah. a few years younger, so I was a little bit behind. But this one, uh, Book of Dreams, was one that kind of captivated me. And, and I miss that. And grabbed me. I, I miss going through the record cabinet, pulling the albums out, sitting on the floor, checking them, yeah. you know, reading the liner notes, looking at the uh, the art. Uh, you know, you, you, yeah, I, I always go on these little rants about streaming and stuff, but you know, it's just, it, it's, it's, it's a totally different experience Yeah, when you're listening it, it, to vinyl. When, when I got back into vinyl, it was, it was one of the first ones that I bought was, was picking, making go. sure that I got yep. this May, partially because of the music, but partially because of the album cover. And I just wanted, yeah. I wanted this piece of art in that's my right. collection. And that's the great thing about this era. And that's the great thing about vinyl coming back is that, that, that the, the melding of music and artwork. Yeah. And, and how, you know, so certain things became so identifiable, even if you didn't know the artist, you saw the artwork, like you knew, even if you didn't know Grateful Dead, you were aware of like the skull and the roses logo. And yeah. You were aware of, of, you know, the, the, the scarab or the beetle for journey, you know, for those, 
for those artists that de- that came up with a logo and then developed it, you know, the Kiss logo, it's, it's that font is identifiable anywhere. Yeah, you know, we absolutely know what it is. So, getting back to what you you, you said a little a little psychedelic, we talk about the the beginnings of of these songs. Right, that's what that's what Steve Miller Band was. I mean, they were formed in in 1966, and they were kind of in San Francisco, so they're right in the middle of psychedelia. But he was also a blues player. So they were kind of like a blues psychedelic band, which yes. I'm not sure. Yeah. Is that is that what Cream was? <laughs> is something, there, I, I, is I there think, a contemporary to them? I mean, is there something like that? Oh, well, I think that was definitely on the scenes in, you know, California. Well, Hendrix is from San Francisco or he's from Seattle. But, uh, but uh, you know, the San Francisco scene had a lot of that going on. Well, I yeah, think. Jefferson and, Airplane, right? I mean, yeah. you had that kind of stuff. A lot of blues-based um, stuff, like ground, like the, the groundwork yeah. uh, was blues. And, you know, but, you know, what can we do with this form of music? How can we push it to a whole different level and make yeah. it interesting? And that's what Cream did. That's what Hendrix did. And, and These uh, guys well, apparently were, Steve yeah. Miller. Yeah, yeah I mean, not, they, you not, know, to, not to yeah. very much success, though. I mean, that's the thing is, is literally... Well, those guys were what they were. They were they were the face men of that of that sound of that kind of thing. And I guess you know, yeah, bands like this, I guess, sort of paled in comparison, or maybe they were just trying to copy what they were doing or or something like that. But uh, yeah, yeah I kind of never Santana, knew that. I, I put them in the in in like with well, Santana, Santana yes. and and that kind of like that that kind of free form stuff that that yeah, there was, was early Santana was that it was that was a going lot of jazz, on yeah. jazz fusion mixed in there, and I, yeah. I just absolutely love that stuff. So, yeah, I think know. that's where Steve Miller was. Yeah. Um, one of the original uh, band members for the Steve Miller band was Boz Skaggs, <laughs> who would yeah. have, he was a guitar, he was the guitar player. Yeah. Um, and he would go on to have his, his own career, uh, Lido Shuffle, Low Down. Yeah. Um, you know, he's got a very great distinctive voice. He's got a yeah, very great. distinctive voice. <laughs> yeah. and, and he only had like three big hits, but that's all he needed because Lido Shuffle is like a driving song. Like you put Lido on, Hit the hit the road, roll down the windows, and, and you're off. But so, he's like like Steve Miller. He is one, like one of those artists where I mean, there are great songs on a few of his albums that he's done. Like you know, some of the deeper cuts are, yeah. are really really good as well. So it's not just a fluke that he's only got those couple of hits. But you know, he's a really good. I mean, I think I, I think he probably you know tried to stay away from the whole mainstream type mm-hmm. of thing. I think he became more. Uh, I wouldn't say a purist, maybe. I don't know. Or maybe he did. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, he's he, he's still, I think he's still, or, or you know, I, I remember getting a recent release of him back in maybe about 10 years ago. He was uh-huh. still putting out albums and I had one of his yeah. later releases yeah. and it was good. Yeah, he did good some, stuff. I heard he some live, just, you know, I heard a live version of Lido. Yeah. And he sounded great. Mm-hmm. You know, the band he was with really recreated it and everything. Uh, so so he didn't stay around too long, Bosquet. So, so he kind of left, but the story here is formed in 1966. They really don't have their first hit until 1973 when, when he would release the album, The Joker. Yeah. And the the, the only hit from that song was The uh, Joker, the right? The song, right, yeah. Which which kind of really, that I don't know what happened because because they, they, the formula changed at, at that album. So that would, have, that would have been the eighth, their eighth album in of basically treading water, not really doing a whole lot. Like, yeah. You know, he had like uh, what living in the USA was like a minor hit from like their early, <laughs> early, yeah. career, right? What, but you yeah. know, it, it, they kind of had that, but then nothing. And then they come out with the Joker and that song, you know, I'm a Joker, I'm a smoker. You, you know, the song um, was, was like their kind of like their breakthrough hit. Mm-hmm. And then they would go back in and, and do Fly Like an Eagle. And then the floodgates opened. It was just kind of right. like Steve, like he had this this three album cycle of the Joker fly like an Eagle and book of dreams was, is again, is the pinnacle. It really is the Zenith of it. You know, yeah. fly like an Eagle may or may not be a better album. I don't think so. But, but book of dreams kind of was, is that was that next evolution of it sure. and, and refining all the, the ideas. And like you said, it was recorded. The, the basic tracks were recorded at the same time. So this was all one thought process mm-hmm. that he was going through. And you can kind of hear the, those albums are very compatible as a, as a double listen, they yeah. really, they really mesh well together and it's, and it's no, uh, no surprise. Well, it's interesting to note that the greatest hits from 74 <laughs> to 78 is pretty much fly like an Eagle and book of dreams. Like yeah. most of the album is made up of songs from both those records. Yeah. So, so, so the, the, <laughs> the greatest hit, the greatest hits has 14 songs on it. Yeah. Seven are from book of dreams. Mm-hmm. 
Six are from <laughs> Fly Like an Eagle, and one is from the Joker. So he somebody literally commented. I think it was a reviewer. It was a review. <laughs> somebody co- actually commented and said, "Just get the greatest need- hits." Yeah, yeah. You just get the greatest yeah. hits. You don't. It, this it, this album is unnecessary right now. This book of dreams. <laughs> so it is. Yeah. It's, it's so weird that somebody puts it. <clears throat> the guy puts out ten albums, but his greatest hits collection is from the last three. Yeah, and there is nothing from the previous seven right. albums on there that should tell again <laughs> that that, nothing against yeah. the earlier stuff but that should tell you what happened in, in that's right so yeah. a switch flipped somewhere in because he doesn't write all the songs he writes a lot of the songs but he doesn't write all of them so he's really yeah. good at at sourcing mate- or he got really good at sourcing material that worked mm-hmm. and adapting it and that's where you get fly like an eagle but I- i'm gonna say i mean you know uh, i still wouldn't get I would still rather have Fly Like an Eagle and Book of Dreams than The Greatest Hits because there's that other stuff on here. Oh, yeah, sure. You know, that, you, that know, you get. We, we, oh. and that's us. You know, we dig deep. So, yeah. like, I, 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 you know, Greatest Hits albums, for the most part, are, gr- are great when you're not really into an artist. You just don't care enough. Yeah. You know, it's or just, you're just, you just getting want, into them and you, you want know, to you, see or, what's out there. Right. You just want to have those, those, those songs that you hear right. on the radio pretty much or whatever. Um, and there have been, since that Greatest Hits album, better compilations that came yes. down the road, you know, yeah, that were more extensive and more, you know, and of course yeah. box sets and that kind of thing. So exactly. Yeah. Because the well yeah. would draw after, after, after this album, after book of dreams, which we'll, we will start to talk about at some point. Um, <laughs> he, that came out in 77. He didn't release another album until 81. And yeah. it was, it was a dud. It was a flop. He comes right back in 82 with Abracadabra. Abracadabra, yeah. Which, which really, you know, and I think that's what it was is, again, we talk about these 70s artists that don't make the leap into the 80s because, and especially if you, if he waited four years, times definitely changed. Between 77 and 81, mm-hmm. music was different. Yeah. Uh, the, that album he put out, like, the second side was one song. It was like 18 minutes long. <laughs> it was just like, What? So then he comes yeah. right back with Abracadabra, which which hit hit big. That was like the perfect him a- adapting to the eighties, and then and then kind of went dry. Um, well, it, show, it also shows though, though he wasn't afraid to experiment. Yeah, he still you know? wasn't so, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So and, and he's st- those kind of little odd little you know those th- those kinds of things that wow, I just thought he was just a really good two three minute songwriter, you know, yeah. like and then he comes out with these like pieces like you know opuses like whatever yeah i dig it i i you know i i I dive into that yeah no i i I, I really like steve miller i got i saw him in 91 um in connecticut Mm -hmm. at a at a uh, an amusement park but the amusement park wasn't open yet so you walk through a a closed amusement park and then you went to like the amphitheater um and he was there great still in 91 he was still great still still incredible now we need to i think before we talk about the 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 album proper, I think we need to, to center 1977 and, and just to show you what Steve Miller was up against. Yeah. Right. And, and I think it's an important thing. So I'm just going to roll through some of the albums that came out in 1977. And, and could this be the greatest year for music? Um, let me go through some and, and you tell me. Okay. And in mm-hmm. no particular order, but these are albums that came out in 1977. <clears throat> and if you listen to this podcast, you may recognize some. Uh, mm. uh, first up, Rumors by Fleetwood Mac Saturday Night Fever soundtrack by the Bee Gees The Stranger by Billy Joel Low yep. by David Bowie My Aim is True by Elvis Costello uh, The Clash's first album Asia mm. by Steely Dan Bad Out of Hell by Meatloaf uh, Lust for Life by Iggy Pop Book of Dreams came out um, Running on Empty by Jackson Brown Little Queen by Heart Street Survivors by Leonard Skinnerd, <laughs> Heroes by David Bowie, Elvis Presley's final album, Moody Blue, after he, he passed away, would come out. Uh, Let There Be Rock by ACDC, The Grand Illusion by Styx, Slow Hand by Eric Clapton, JT by James Taylor. The first Foreigner album would come out as well. News of the World by Queen. I mean, do I need, should I stop or like out of the blue, ELO. out of the blue by electric yep. light orchestra point mm-hmm. of no return by Kansas with, yeah. you know, they talk about Prague, if, like popular Prague. Mm-hmm. That's like, that's like the who's who of, of, of seventies music. In just, that's just in 77. That's a great year. Yeah, absolutely. There's right. No, I mean, no, that no, you could, no you, doubt could build about a, yep. you could build a collection 
just you could start a record collection just yeah. on that year you could, alone. You could yeah, build absolutely. a collection starting with yep. 77 and work out yep. from there. And and in there is Steve Miller band. And and he occupies a, a different, <clears throat> there's so many different artists there. You've got Skinner and, and Saturday Night Fever and all that other stuff. Yeah. Um, what's so special about this one is again, his, I think it's his song selection. Um, the, the way the album is laid out, it's kind of like an up tempo down tempo. He kind of alternates a little bit. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there, there's that is kind of like you get an up tempo with, with jet airliner, which is the way the album <laughs> opens with threshold, which is like a minute long instrumental. It's all the psychedelic stuff, but right. jet airliner <laughs> kind of kicks in right as, as that's ending and it, and it starts, mm-hmm. it, it's, you know, I, I think it outdoes fly like an eagle. Fly like an eagle is kind of the same thing, but, but it's more mellow fly like an eagle. Yeah, Jet Airliner just kicks in. It's got this just really chunky guitar intro, kind of building up. You're kind of getting into it, and and eventually his his like you hear him like inhale, and then he starts the vocals. It's just a great like it's mm-hmm. just a great way to start the album. It really really sets yeah, the table. And FM radio at the time <clears throat> was pl- they were playing Threshold. Yeah. before the song the, the, that was always a thing you never heard jet airliner by itself like yeah. just start i mean now you pretty much hear it on classic rock radio that in that in that way but you know back in the day yeah they they would go the whole route and just play that whole intro and yeah so and it had a little great. proggy little yeah. proggy dna in there yep you know uh which which again was if you're if you've got sticks on the charts at the time you kind of have that that kind of aesthetic there with and, and Kansas, if they're on yeah. the charts at the time, there's that little sub genre of yeah. not full on Prague, but the pro, pro, Prague that's a little more accessible, more you know, accessible, not, not more the, rock, more, yeah. you know, more guitar driven, more, you know, um, a lot of it, you know, a lot of the American Prague type stuff was like that. It was more, I think more rock and roll, yeah, more rooted, rooted in, in guitar, but, but they were always, yeah. Oh, there was, like I said, there was always these little musical interludes or something that, that, just got your attention, you know, right out the gate. And, and I always, yeah, it was just a part of the landscape, part of the soundscape. So, yeah. and, and yep. this song had, had, this song had to be censored for radio. Cause uh, you, you know, the, the, <laughs> the, the line is, you know, funky shit going down in the city. Yeah, right. That's right. They had to change that for AM radio to funky kicks, funky kicks going down that... in the city. But I think nowadays they just play it. It's like, what are they, who's going to mm-hmm. complain? That's certainly not the it's worst. Barely, it, the thing of it is, it's like, it's barely noticeable. Yeah. Right. When you hear shit, he's like, shit, it's like the way he <laughs> says it. It's like, it, it, you, you know, if you're, you, you, you could totally. He's not emphasizing not, it. Yeah. Right. You're not, you're not like, oh my God, you know, like. <laughs> what did he say? How could Steve Miller do that? It's like, no, it's, yeah. it's okay. And it's it like, just, who cares? You know? Yeah. yeah. It was just part of, part of the song. It was just a word that fit and it was fine. But, but back mm-hmm. then I remember it was, it was like, when you listen to it on the radio, you, you have to get ready to hear funky kicks. <laughs> yeah you know instead yeah. it's like all right fine like whatever or sometimes they would even <laughs> bleep it i I've, I've heard them even bleep it out like really? you know you uh-huh. can actually hear you know funky in the city you know like you know, yeah you know in certain certain cases they just too dip, but they yeah. just dip it out you know, right like, come on now yeah and then and then you know and, and like i said this kind of vacillates between like the slow and, and the, the fast and slow stuff and you get something like winter time which is kind of atmos- very atmospheric very slow yeah. very down tempo Mm-hmm. And then swing town, and then swing town, yeah, which kind of kind of fades in again, you know, just that, you know, that really upbeat, catchy yeah. kind of thing, and it, yeah, it's <laughs> the the drums on swing town, I love. They're yeah. just kind of oh, the whole song. The way it's just kind of, it's just a. This is just a fun record to listen to because the the those the the big standout hits are just so really they're just so good. Mm-hmm that they propel this album forward and, and the way they're staggered, you know, it's not like, it's not like the stranger where it's like, boom, 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 boom. This yeah. is kind of like, okay, jet airliner. Then we give you something else. Then you got swing town, which was like another big one. Uh, and then you got true fine love, which is just a, that's a deep cut. Uh, you know, I re- mm-hmm. absolutely remember that song. It's that that's kind of up tempo as well. And then you got something slow with wish upon a star. So he really kind of, kind of mixes it up. Uh, and it yeah. gives you gives you some different looks at things, which I which that's that's what I kind of like about this album. I think we we might have mentioned it <clears throat> perhaps with our Tusk episode, but uh, I think we did comment on how just how we don't think about how like you when you put together a track listing and the and the way it the you know it's formatted and it, yeah. and it 
that takes time and it, it it's actually harder than you you might think i would i would i would imagine yeah. it's, it, it's it's like that even with making a playlist of, of various songs right you like you you don't you don't always know exactly how to do it is it a yeah. b c is it when do you want to hear this song when do what, i what want to hear after it right do i want two really rocking songs in a row yeah. you, you know that kind of thing so yeah i mean it it's an art form in itself almost, you know, it, 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 to actually take that time and to, and to craft that. Yeah. Especially if it's not a know. concept album where you're, you're kind of making yeah. statements and, and things are connected and they're intertwined yeah. that, that like, like Pink Floyd, like that's going to take care of itself. It's just a matter of kind of, sure. You, you've got all those connectors already there. And then you're just kind of putting the big pieces in where and speaking of, well, speaking okay. of like <laughs> compilation albums that, that to me, if you ever, if you're into Pink Floyd or want to get into Pink Floyd, I highly recommend uh, Echoes. The uh, it was like a three CD compilation, and it had all the best stuff on that on that compilation. And they they purposely like ran one track into another, and 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 actually created new little musical you know connections to mm-hmm. these songs. Like you get a song from the Wall connected to something from the early days or whatever, hmm. you know. And they it's That's pretty really cool. well done. Yeah. It's really, it's it's because the band did it themselves. So it wasn't kind like of, they it just kind of gives you an, an auditory experience. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's so, pretty neat. Anyway. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> kind of, <laughs> kind of cool. Yeah, Check it, that out. Echoes. Yeah. E- Echoes. It's a great comp. I don't even know if it's, I don't know if it's, you can't, I don't think you can buy it now uh, physically. I think it's, you know, it has to be on the streaming because it, it, it's, it's, it cost a fortune to get. I, I tried to get it on vinyl actually, because I really? figured this is like, the best of the best, you know, it's like, you really don't need, cause a lot of the songs are long anyway. <laughs> right. So, you, but they got like the shine on you, crazy diamond, all uh-huh. seven parts in, in a row. And then you, and then it cuts into time and it, you know, like that, you know, it, it's really, really well done. Well, but anyway, I'll have to check uh, that, that out. That, I'll put that it. might have to be a, a, a top five in the future of talking about greatest hits albums. Maybe we'll, we'll do something. Wow, like that. That's interesting. Yeah. Or maybe a live show. Who knows? <laughs> Yeah. Live shows. Mm-hmm. Speaking of which, mm-hmm. you can check out live shows every other Wednesday mm-hmm. uh, on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter as well. So you can join us there in person as we talk about other things. Of course. That are that are music and movie related. <laughs> um, Jungle Love Open Side 2. Ah. Another great, just like this, this, this album to me is just a home run. Like it, it brings back just so much. So much memories of like sitting in my room, get, grabbing my sister's copy, uh, whether yeah. or not she knew, and, and putting it on. Maybe even listening to this in the library, perhaps because you know the library that that the library, was nearby yeah. had. <laughs> God, what a collect! What a collection they had. They did. You they know, they had a great collection. Yeah, yeah, we were pretty, we, pretty, we, uh, pretty hip to uh, for a library. Yeah, you know, Cheech and Chong albums. They had like all kinds of crazy stuff. And I remember that. And this I stuff remember, too. You know, yeah. so you kind of grab it. And and this was one of those ones that this is one of those, like I said in the beginning, this is like one of those jackets that you put on in the 70s. This album is that for me as well, because yeah. one of the early ones that, like I said, when I was even before I was forming my musical taste, this was kind of a thrust upon me. Right. Because my sister had it. And, you know, yeah. I don't recall that she had a whole lot of albums. She, she was into Elvis and she was into a couple of other things. So. She didn't have a lot, but this one I specifically remember being mm-hmm. in the house and, and she had it and kind of taking it out and again, being just being captivated by the art. So it was yeah. just, a, it was a total experience of, wow, this is really neat looking and then putting it on and, and kind of going through the tracks. And then, you know, you've got the, the, the one of my favorites is the steak. Yes, that is I, a great track. Effin, effin <laughs> love that song. Yes, yes you do. Yeah, you know, and, that, and that's yep. a deep cut. That That's a, that's an FM cut. Just the way it starts off, like with the just like, like the plucking of the guitars, like don't, 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 and it, it kind of like echoes, yeah. and it just gets into this blue, slow, like blues jam kind of yeah, feel to I it. I love it, you know. And and his guitar playing on it is just, you know, uh, you know, he he st- he still shows the chops, like you would think for the seventies. <laughs> and we talk a lot about progs and synthesizers that that's what you get here. No, he's he's a blues guitar player at heart. It's yeah, not unlike, just, uh, it's, uh, it reminds me of the Joe Walsh tune. Uh, was it song 49? You know, dan, 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 mm-hmm. dan, dan, you know what I'm talking about? Yep. It has that riff, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, or, or man, it kind of like, it reminds me a little bit of Manish Boy. Yeah. In the last, like yeah. that kind of like that slowly moving. It's like a big, it's like a big machine that's like slowly moving, you know, mm-hmm. kind of, kind of rolling along and, and God. You mentioned that this album was thrust upon you. 
Um, but it's an easy album to get into. Yeah. You know what so I mean? It, 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 doesn't take, because... it doesn't take it doesn't take any effort to like this album yes. whatsoever. Yeah, I, I it's mean that's instantly that... likable. You know exactly. I didn't mean that yeah. she or like, oh, you're gonna listen to this thrust upon yeah. meaning there there wasn't a lot to listen right. to. Like I it wasn't didn't take much to get into. Right. I, well, yeah, just, I wasn't yeah. getting a lot. I was a kid, what was this 77? So I was like, yeah. what, eleven years old? Right. So I really wasn't in the the buying public. I was like the AM radio listening public and maybe recording. Yeah. So when my sister had this, when I say thrust upon me, it was kind of like it's here. She's got it. There's not a whole lot of other stuff to listen to. So I'm going to listen to this because it's, it was there. And I didn't want to listen to David Cassidy or, or <laughs> like other stuff that she may have had. Like I said, she was just yeah. starting to get into Bruce Springsteen. And that was a little too probably esoteric for an 11 year old. But this was was there because the stuff was on the radio already. So Jet Airliner was already on the radio and Swingtown. So it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I, I know these songs. I heard this mm -hmm. before. And then I got got to listen to the other stuff and hear some some different takes because all the hits are like up tempo yeah you know those yep. are all the up tempo songs are like the, the hit 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 his other stuff which is more atmospheric it's more mellow probably closer to like the psychedelic trappings that he was leaving mm -hmm. behind you know like winter time and and wish upon a star that's really kind of you can absolutely see people just smoking some weed and just kind of laying out <laughs> yeah. and kind of yeah. letting this, letting it's this definitely one an album over. of the times for, yeah. for sure. No Absolutely. doubt about that. <laughs> Commenting on, you know, the, the, the sexual revolution of the seventies, the, you know, all kinds of great stuff, you know, that happened at that, at that, in yeah. that era. But, um, yeah, I, it was like that for me too. I was like, uh, you know, my mom was a huge John Denver fan. So, and of course she had a lot of old records, a lot of old timey type stuff, big band and, but every now and again, somehow, some way, we'd get albums like this, like kind of mixed in, and most likely get... due to, <laughs> most likely due to my brother, yeah. like like he, cause, you know, he used to borrow albums from friends, and you know, they never give them back. <laughs> I was going to say, thing, quote, you know, quote unquote, borrow <laughs> <laughs> permanent. But lend. it was a thing. It's like you know, we yeah. ended up owning this stuff, and that's how I got into it. Like even like I remember getting. That's how I first got into Paul McCartney was the w Wings Greatest Hits. Mm -hmm. That somehow miraculously, miraculously appeared in our record cabinet, <laughs> and I love that stuff as well. It's very yeah. much like, like like Steve Miller, in the sense where it's instantly likable. And it's like I always thought some of these songs were Beatles songs at the time, and and they weren't. It's just like who's Wings, and then you hear the songs. Oh, that's Paul McCartney and Wings. Yeah. I, I thought that was the Beatles. You know, yeah, because um, you don't know. You don't right, know. Exactly. Uh, oddly enough, speaking of Paul McCartney, he worked with Steve Miller. Didn't you, uh, did you like that lead in? That, that's yeah. where I was going. That's what I was you going teed for. it up. <laughs> they, they actually back in, I think it was either the late sixties or early seventies. Mm -hmm. Paul McCartney guessed it on, on a Steve Miller song uh, under a pseudonym. I think it was, I forget what it was. And then fast forward to what, 1996, 1997, uh, when McCartney would release flaming pie. Flaming pie. Yeah. Steve Miller <clears throat> would show up with, uh, on, I used to be bad, which is a great, a great song. And they, and they kind yep. of duet, um, it was, I was so happy. It was surprising to see, and, and I think he produced a couple of tracks too, or he, he was on more than one track, but, but I used to be bad. Yeah. was kind of like the highlight. There were a couple of tracks that I yeah. think it was like three, maybe two or three songs on the album yeah, that, that he worked on. Him. So that was great yeah. to kind of see. And he's in such great voice. He's a guy that his voice hadn't really changed. Well, he had, had very, kind of like a saw. He didn't have like a gruff, like Bob Seger no, voice. It was, he had it was kind very of a, mellow, soft Very mellow. Voice. So yeah. It, it, mm -hmm. yeah. So he, so he was able to kind of retain that. And, and yeah. when you hear him pop up in, in like 1996, it's it's like, it sounds like, like 1977, Steve Miller. Like yeah. he just sounds the same, yep. you know? And I really kind of, I, I really dug it. And uh, it was, it was nice to see him pop up. And then in 2016, he gets inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> and uh, th well, this is a common complaint, right? He gets inducted. And then afterwards, you know, you go to like the behind the stage and then, you know, you're holding your award and people are interviewing you, whatever. And then he starts going off on like a, a like a, a tangent about like how his band members had to pay for tickets. Mm. You know, how it's like, OK, you know, like you're supposedly about, you know, treating the artists right and da, da, da. And, you know, but but these guys had to buy their own tickets. Like, how do you not give them the tickets? And the response was, and this is so stupid. <laughs> the response was, well, we inducted Steve Miller. We didn't induct the Steve Miller band. Oh my God. So you can't give like six tickets. You really going to charge these guys? Like, like I, I was like, I have a couple of grand. I think that's like 6,000 a ticket, whatever it is. It's like, really? You're going to charge these guys? 
They're going to they're yeah. going to play even if he, they're not the original Steve Miller band or they're not, you know he's getting inducted as Steve Miller. Right. right. <clears throat> and you're going to make these guys pay for tickets? Unbelievable. Stupid. It is stupid. Stupid. And, and it, it's it's an insult. It, yeah, it really is. And it's, he, you know, he was I, that's the thing. He was pissed off. He's like, you know, like this is, you know, this is like the most unrock and roll thing to do. Mhm. Is that is just kind of charge people. And and I've heard other other artists, I think like Tommy Shaw, if Sticks ever gets inducted, he's like, I may not even show up because I have to pay for my wife to come. Yeah. Like, yeah. okay, I, you know, I get I, he probably has the money. I, I get that he's kind of standing on the on the position that the principal. You should get thing. like yeah. four, you know four or five, six free tickets. You know, like, that's right. This yeah. is the once in a lifetime thing. You're really gonna like chisel. <laughs> you're gonna chisel these artists right. for their family members and make them pay. Yeah. It's yeah. like. Yeah, Most, it's definitely the principle of the thing. It's just, it's, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Award so, shows are just getting, <clears throat> they're just, they're, they're kind of getting a little wanky or something. Yeah. They're just, yeah, they're, they're just not what it used to be. No. You know, I don't really watch no. them anymore. Yeah. Oh, right. are you going to watch the Grammys? No. You're going to watch the no. Oscars? Nah, not really. <laughs> you know, like there, that disconnect happens of, you know what? I'm, I'm happy, you know, whether win, win or lose, it's not about, it used to be, I used to be so much into like, oh, I want, Oh, sure. This one, this one to win for Grammys. Best Supporting Actor, and I want this one to win for Best Picture. It's like, it doesn't change whether or not I like the picture. Mm-hmm. You know, and as we've spoken about in the past, a lot of times they were probably wrong anyway. And now you know, this, whole, this our, new thing this year with them doing away with the technical awards on the, you know, the broadcast and, yeah. and, and giving them away before, everybody's sort of like, you know, up in arms about that. And, you know, it's, it's just not right because yeah. the technical awards, they're important. Yeah, like they, it or not, they, I mean, you know, it's not just about the fashion. I'm sorry, yeah, you know, that, it's you know, innovate. They're they're the ones that innovate. They're the ones, they're that, the ones that, that, that make the, the the editor like not getting not getting his due on on national team. No, that's not right. Yeah, it's silly. that's not right at all. It's it's, it's, it's silly. Silly. it all started yeah. with 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 Steve Miller. No, actually, <laughs> I don't know. Was Rush was before that? I think. Mm. Mm-hmm. Right, Lifeson was was the one, but but it, it doesn't take away from from Book of Dreams, which it's still to me that ba- baffling. That someone waits seven albums before they hit. I, I don't understand how a record company would hang on, honestly, hang on to an artist today. for that long. No way that could right? happen today. Back, yeah. that, back then, that was kind of like you had a contract and, and as long as you came close, I was looking at some of his older albums, hit number 82, hit number 38, mm-hmm. not really stuff that, that would engender a lot of, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, it left me, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of confidence. Right. It yeah. wouldn't engender a lot of confidence in the record company. If you're hitting 82 and 38 right. and you're six or seven albums in. Yeah. It's like, uh, okay. Like what, you know, when are you getting well, around I mean, to it, it? In in Steve Miller's case, I mean, what are you, what are you doing it for? Are you doing it for the the success? Or are you doing it to, for, you know, for the art of it? I mean, well, that, he was obviously lot... doing it for the art of it. Right. I mean, yeah, that, that, course, that shows you, know. you that sticking through and, and going through those, the, the cycles. Cause he, if he started in 66 and didn't hit until 77, Mm-hmm. You saw a significant change in music, right? Yeah. The, the psychedelic thing did not did not age well. It did not stay around very right. long. Well, maybe into the early seventies, uh, and he had, he had ditched it. Right, seventy three is when the Joker came out. So he was he shed it just in time, yeah, and kind of really was able to reinvent his career. But like well, you well, said, I, I can't see an I can't see I can't see REM putting out ten albums before. Mm-hmm. You get to green, you know, I can't yeah. like the police, they only put out five albums, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Like where, where was the, where was well, the learning curve? Right. I think back in the earlier days, it was, I think somebody had made the comment that it was a different animal. Like record companies were, were, you know, th- things were growing at that point thing, you know, cause people would tour and yeah. then they put out an album. And it was two separate things. They weren't putting in an al- They weren't putting out an album to tour, right? They, you know, they they played live. If they had new material, they would play it. But it wasn't necessarily to promote a new record in the early mm-hmm. days. And now and then, but of course, the record companies come in and they they change the game a bit. And that's what happened. It's like now we have to we got we got to promote this new material. So that's the tour. That's the world tour. That yeah. you know, whatever. And most, a lot of artists today that were, that had to go through that, I guess, from the sixties and Steve Miller, I'm sure is, is probably one of them will tell you that the, you know, the record company, you know, if if we could do it all over again, we, we would do things differently. I don't know how, but you know, they, 
the biz, the nature of the beast kind of thing. Yeah. The business is, is just, it's, it's, it's all well, bullshit I mean, he, he or, bene- or messed he was a, up, you know? I mean, he was a benefactor. Yeah. He benefited from it. Yeah. Because he got, you know, they hung on to that contract for so mm-hmm. long capital. I mean, for Christ's sake, 66 and, and your pinnacle is at 77 and it was, and your greatest hits only covered the, the previous two albums. Yeah. <laughs> Before it's <laughs> yeah. just a crazy, that's just a crazy, like that's a crazy music story. Yeah. 66. Yeah. I mean, you know, the Beatles were in, in the height of it. The stones were in the height of it. The who were just starting out and, you know, kind of getting, getting together. And this guy was just starting out, but didn't have anything until close to 10 years later. And his, his best selling right. album would come out. 10 would, would come out in 77. This was that this would be their best selling album, uh, book mm-hmm. of dreams. They would not, he would not be able to match this, especially, like I said, he took four years off after this kind of lost. I don't know why you would do that. Cause he had nothing but momentum, right? You fly like an Eagle and this were right on top of each other. Well, and these were, it, I think you've said it before when you said they hit a kind of a pinnacle and you know, when you, you get to that point, you're just like, how do we follow? Maybe he just didn't know how to follow it up. Huh? at that particular point in time. You know what I mean? So not like Lindsay Buckingham. Oh, we, here we go. You know, he, <laughs> got, got to bring Lindsay into you the, did into it the this conversation. Time. I did it this time. But like he said, dollar into they, the jar. They, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> with rumors and with Tusk, you know, they, they had to, ca- they carried on very quickly and, you know, but he didn't want to do rumors too. So, but yeah. in this case, perhaps, you know, maybe he just didn't have it. You know, and then, you know, going back, you're, you're, you're 10 albums in, you know, you're maybe he was a little burnt out. Who knows? Yeah, you know, it, I don't know. It, yes, it's just I a do? very it's just a very strange musical uh, occurrence. Yeah. You know, because when we talk about all these other groups like the Who, they had hits early. Stones had hits early. Right. And that yeah. propelled them through some of the lean times. I'm not saying everything that the Stones did was great, but they started out or like they started out as a sensation. Yes, this wasn't even had, a this wasn't even a slow roll. Ten albums that, in, it's like you know, they, with the constant touring and everything, yeah. and then they would play these hits. They would play those old yeah. songs and keep them alive. And yeah, um, yeah. If you're if you're having album after album with no hits, you know, I, I get you know. Obviously, you're still touring because I know they, they they put out some live stuff too. So yeah. it had to be almost like a Grateful Dead type thing where right they the, don't really the, care, the they didn't really care about the, that were out there. Yeah, didn't yeah. care about the the albums per se. But mm-hmm. wanted to follow, but followed the artist, which was what the dead was. They could put out, you know, a, a turd on a platter. It didn't make a difference because <laughs> yeah. that's what that wasn't what the fans want. The fans were there to follow them around and get the experience of the dead show. Yeah. The albums were more just contractual obligations of okay, you're going to put something out, and okay, here we go, like feed the machine, so we can have a contract. Mm-hmm. And and I'm, maybe maybe that's what the deal was with Steve Miller. You know, because these albums were not, you know, they're kind of trippy and kind of weird. I was listening to a couple of stuff. It's okay, but it's not, it's not, it's not fly like an Eagle and it's not book of dreams. It's not even on the same level. It's just a different, it's just different. Yeah. You know, so how did this guy all of a sudden seven albums in have an epiphany of, okay, you know, let's do this. And then he he hit, hit big. Yeah, I never really heard him having that kind of thing though, where where people would follow him. Yeah, it must have happened, but Steve, I don't know. You, know, I'm trying you to... think Steve Miller, you think this stuff? You don't. You don't. You, you know, it's 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 kind of a mystery as to how popular he might have been with with just fans. You know, who who were like just devotees of what he was doing. Maybe just a certain sound that they were following. Not necessarily like, but they were other artists that around at the, and they would follow them as well. Yeah, and he was I don't just know. sort of caught up in the mix there. Who knows? But, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I, when but, I he, think... but he survived, but he did it. He, you know, he, yeah. he, 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 you know, persevered and he reached that, like you said, like that pinnacle. And, uh, but yeah, but after that. It was that, almost like he sprinted to the finish. It was kind of like, you know, yeah. the, there was like a run up, run up, run up. And then all of a sudden he he releases like three like bangers. I mean, a joke, the Joker is, you know, that was the only hit song off of that. But yeah, the two following, I mean, it, it could be as good as, you know, the first Fleetwood Mac album in Rumors. You could put it up against that. Or you could put it up against, you know, Eagles Hotel California in the long run. As yeah. far as like two album cycles. Fly Like an Eagle and Book of Dreams are, are right there with that. You know, I, That's I, right. so it's so yeah. strange that there was no consistency and you don't really hear the 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 makings of this and on the stuff before you know Mm -hmm. you know that's really what what's strange about this and it's kind of like like these two albums are kind of like outliers in his career but they're so great yeah 
And yeah. again, again, instantly likable. Yeah. <laughs> just, just you jump right in and you're, you're, and you're swimming in like a nice pool, right? It's like, you know, yeah. and it's very, it's really great social music. You know, you, you're hanging out. It's the perfect type of music. It's to absolutely have on summer. It's absolutely summer music. Yeah. Even, yeah, even no though there's a song it. called Winter Time on it, this is absolutely summer music. <laughs> I still think of like I watch. I, I can't think like Jungle Love. I can't. I can't not uh, think about Everybody Loves Raymond because that beca- and I, that became like the theme song. Oh, it did. Like in the later seasons, because <laughs> they had a they had a thing where they were like, you know, the family <laughs> was all together over you know the, uh, his parents and there was a blizzard or something and they were supposed, you know, Raymond and Deborah was supposed to go away and, and it, 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 they got snowed in. So they were all together and they're of course, you know, driving each other crazy. And so then uh, Robert puts on jungle love. I love this song. <laughs> and, they're, and they're, and they're all like dancing to the to jungle love. And it's, 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 it's such a, it was such a great <laughs> moment that they use that for the 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 opening like the last season that was like the opening theme for the show really? like that's the, interesting they, they would, and they would and they played that scene of all of them dancing like it was just great you know yeah, a little bit of a, <laughs> a little bit of a resurgence yeah, yeah. he's i mean he is he's certainly weathered the storm he still tours uh he still sounds great yeah and like i said he you know he had abracadabra after that in 82 which was kind of like the last kind of the last gasp he kind of started doing a little bit more. He did, he did an album of standards. I think he, if I recall, he kind of started dipping, dipping in, into some of the older stuff. And uh, yeah, well, he did you know, a couple, music I mean, had changed was, significantly by then anyway. Fly like an Eagle. He does a cover of uh, Sam Cooke's you send me, yeah. which is pretty, pretty well. I like the, like the way his voice kind of goes up and down mm-hmm. on that track. He really extends the notes and the, in the, in the lyrics and stuff. And yeah, it's, it's a great cover. And in, in fact, I, I, where was that when we were doing our covers thing? I, that would have been a nice, <laughs> that would have been a nice, uh, <laughs> nice contender there because I completely forgot about that one. If, if you um, can, if you want to see how we missed that, you could check out our top five uh, mm-hmm. covers episode. It's out there somewhere uh, on our yeah. listing, and you can see that that did not make the list, but maybe it should have. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, he did a lot of cover. I mean, he did a. Uh, after this, he, you know, even after Abracadabra, I tried to kind of catch up with him again when around the time I saw him in 91 and he had a song mm. called Ya Ya, which I think was a cover. Um, I, I, was the album called Born to be Blue or something like that? I couldn't even find it when I was looking yeah. like on Spotify. Like that, that stuff yeah. wasn't even there anymore. And I'm kind of like, oh, where, what happened? He did. I knew he made an album of kind of like standards, but mm-hmm. it was I couldn't even find it. So that might be a lost uh, a lost treasure somewhere, but, but he has endured. I, I kind of put him in the, in the Bob Seeger category, yep. you know, like yep. those B, you know, and I hate to say B listers, but <laughs> like well. there's levels in rock and roll. And, but these guys were just as important. Like they filled in yeah. the soundtrack, yeah. you know, I know you, what you've, you're got, you've got yeah. the monsters like Zeppelin and, and the stones and Paul right. McCartney and in the seventies and Elton they John, were just the level right below. Yeah. The the, those guys right. are the, like yep. the pinnacles. Those are like the yep. pantheons. And then below that though, you've got these groups like sticks and foreigner and, and, and Steve Miller band and Bob Seger providing just great music that's, consistently. That's right. Yeah. And it's accessible. A, yeah. Very yep. like it was just all this patchwork and, and, the the stuff that we rattled off it, that came out in 77 was like a who's who a who's who yeah. of classic rock meatloaf that yeah. was a monster i mean how many monster albums i mean that was like w- probably the, one of the biggest selling albums rumors came out the same year as this yet That's this right. was still able to sell three million copies so you got you just think about the amount of music that was being bought and consumed at the time mm-hmm Right. It was yeah, like, you're right. Yeah. It was like a fertile ground. If, if you got like the, those, and those are all like watershed albums, right? Like, you know, bad out of hell was a mo- you know, monster for meatloaf and rumors and all this foreigners debut album. These are all, all these are all giant albums, but there was, yeah. ro- there was room for everybody. That's right. You know, ELO is yep. out of the blue. That was their pinnacle album. It was a double album and it sold it. It sold a shit ton as well. Yeah. So there's just like, all these people were buying these same, like this was all the same. I think this was all the same consumer who was just like, it had to be like, you know, like going into a candy store. Mm-hmm. Of all this stuff that was just out like, Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'll get, uh, I'll get Kansas this week, you know, and I'll get, I'll get this one and I'll, I'll pick up rumors. I'll pick up the stranger. My Billy, we forgot about Billy Joel, the stranger, all this That's stuff right. was there. And, and Steve Miller was a part of it. And he was a big part of that, of that year's success. So kudos, uh, kudos to him. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, those are the days where, you know, you go into a record store and like, what, what are the new really, and the mosaic, I've just imagined, yeah, you know, of seeing that end cap 
of, yeah, of, 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 of all album the album covers, covers, right? By the end of that year, especially, and because these things yeah. were still high on the charts and they were still, yeah, probably still on that rack, you know, still selling real, real well. Yeah, I just, you know, I just miss those days, man. <laughs> yeah, know, we, we, we were there, but not really. Stores, we were but there, but not really conscious. Yeah, right. <laughs> 77, I was listening to the story of Star Wars on vinyl. And I read <laughs> yeah, about exactly. Roscoe, we were, Roscoe Lee Brown. Music was just, you know, it, it was, was there, but it was, it was other things. there, but we, you know, we didn't know who was who. We didn't know, yeah. you know, whatever we, you know, it just. Yeah, it was still it getting was influences from outside. It was still it was, getting. Right. You it know, was what, very, ex, very exciting time yeah. to get into this, into this. And I'm, I'm very, very grateful that we, we actually were that young at that point in time. Yeah to see this stuff come rolling out, album, you know, year after year, we were there for all of it. And I, I you know, so yeah. we're still kicking, still kicking, still here. <laughs> and we're still talking about this so, stuff. So so I, I think, I, I think to wrap up, I think what we're saying though, is we didn't really talk about fly like an Eagle, but I think, I think you've, you've made a pretty good case to, to do yeah. a double listen is to I, li- I, listen yeah, to I fly like an Eagle first and then listen to this. And you'll, yeah. Again, they're 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 not earth shattering shatteringly different, and that's the point. That's right. Is that it's it's w- one thought, and then this kind of is the refinement because it is a little more polished. Um, I I like Book of Dreams a little bit better just because it's got some of the the more synthesizer-y stuff in there too, like like peppered in. Yeah, which kind of gives it a little more more of a mystical feel. Um, but I think I think you you hit on something is is check out Fly Like an Eagle first, and then check out Book of Dreams. I was uh, totally obsessed with the song "Fly Like a Needle" for for a time. I remember just it, it became an earworm. You know, I was just I was so obsessed with that song, and I yeah. used to wait. It's one of those songs that you had the radio waiting to tape it. <laughs> yeah. You know, like you know, like because I, I and then and then it, and then it came out on CD, and I think I had that was the only one that I actually bought the album by Steve Miller. So, but and of course the greatest hits, but but yeah, but no, definitely get these two albums. Do not get the greatest. Don't don't just depend on the greatest hits because there's yeah. some. You'll come pretty really, close, but you'll miss some of the good stuff. But you'll miss some gems. Yeah, you know, um, that that do not appear on that greatest hit. So yeah, definitely those. And it's not you know you're pretty much getting a little you know few extra tracks as, as you're getting the greatest hits, but you're getting those few extra tracks to boot. So just I highly recommend both yeah, of those records. It's all so, good stuff. Yep. Steve yep. Miller, he he certainly deserves it. He's earned it. Yep. It's Miller time. <laughs> there it is. I was waiting for that in the beginning. I was like, <laughs> oh, you thought that was going to be the open? Yeah. It's Miller yeah. time. We're cracking yeah. open a, <laughs> a frosty bottle of Book of Dreams. Um, no, he's, he, he's, he's a true rock and roll gem. I, I, I just, you know, he's one of my favorites. Like it, he's just a guy I've always rooted for just because he came so, he came on so early in my consciousness. So he was yeah. kind of like in the, he's in the back of my brain just from like, like this experience of, of this album and seeing it and the visuals and everything. So he's always going to have a, like a kind of, he's going to have a reserved seat in my brain at a, at, a, at one of the back tables. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that's going to do it for this episode of the 3324 podcast. New episodes come out every Thursday. Those are like full length things. Uh, and then we do some shorter stuff on Mondays as well. That that's the little tide you over. That's kind of like a little appetizer to kind of wet the whistle Mm-hmm. Uh, tied you over to Thursday when we've got the big stuff coming out. Also, every other week, like I said earlier, we do live, live shows, shows. Yep, which are your too. chance to interact and 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 comment. And, and we absolutely love the banter and love the interaction with everybody that shows up. So that's a fun way to be a part of this because we've got great subjects that we talk about when we do those shows as well. Uh, those subjects are really made for interaction as well, and not just us kind of downloading content, but we. We take the comments and we and we work off them and we play off them and, and acknowledge them as well. So mm-hmm. uh, a lot of fun, a fun time all around. So uh, if you're here, you probably already know that. So we thank you for listening. It, it means a lot to us as we are in the beginnings of year two uh, of this podcast. It, it's nothing but love and nothing but uh, thanks and appreciation. So on behalf of Eric, this has been Dean and we will definitely for this album, see you on the flip side. You've been listening to the 3324 Podcast with Dean Legiro and Eric Cooper. You can find us on your favorite podcast provider. So please like, subscribe, and rate to become a part of the 3324 family. Your feedback is important, so make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at 3324podcast and on Twitter at 3324p to join the conversation. 